Hey there, I'm Jo and this is Looking Outside, the podcast that explores new perspectives beyond the familiar. I am a CPG innovator and with this show, I'm seeking a fresh take on business topics with some of the most influential and original thinkers. If you find yourself curiously peeking over the fence at what is happening outside your market, industry, or field of knowledge, then this show will help you to explore more of that. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. Today, we are looking outside perspectives and how stretching your mind into new explorative areas related to your work or not can be not just good fun, but strategically beneficial. And joining me today is someone who has truly helped me to stretch my perspective since coming into Foresight, Philip Ryan. Hey, Philip. Hi, Joan. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Now, not everyone has been exposed to your brilliance just yet. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I am a partner at Ipsos Strategy 3, which is a brand and innovation consultancy where, um, as part of Ipsos, a large market research firm, I lead our innovation and foresight work. But outside of that, I live in Brooklyn, wife, two kids, dog, um, active in lots of different things, lots of interests outside of just the gen- general work that I do and, and happy to be here. Obviously, you, uh, you in the audience would pick up Philip's accent. So you're you're obviously from Ireland. Yes, indeed. Yes. And uh, it's funny, I'm from Ireland, clearly still have an Irish accent, but have lived in New York for about 22 years now, but actually grew up all over. So lived all over the world, like grew, um, was born in Ireland, but we lived in the Middle East, in Saudi and Bahrain when I was a kid, in Cyprus. Um, I spent some time living in Spain, in, um, in Korea. So have sort of been around lots of different places, but have actually lived in New York for the majority of my, of my life. Amazing. So you've lived in those different parts of the world and like I've, I've tried to write them down, Middle East, Cyprus, Spain, Korea. So they're all quite uh, distinct, I would say, culturally. Maybe you could call them like a little bit less Western or less mainstream versus New York <laughs> versus Brooklyn. So how, yes. how are you finding that, um, that culturally, that change between those different parts of the world that you've had exposure to versus where you are now? It's probably because of all of that, that I ended up in New York, actually. So having moved around a lot as a as a child, I actually went back to Ireland and went to all secondary high school uh, back in Ireland when, when I was a teenager. But before that, I'd lived in all these places and during college did years abroad and all of that sort of thing as well. And I think it was because of moving around that actually made me think, hey, New York would be fun. I'm going to go there for a couple of years. And New York is an interesting place because you actually have people from all of those countries that are here that you bump into maybe not as often as you'd like but you definitely have that influence from around the world that has made its way into the city for those of you who don't know i've just recently moved to new jersey and hoboken which is right across the hudson from from new york so i'm trying to hop in every once in a while but um it's really a cultural uh, meld uh, of different cultures, obviously, but different personalities. And um, you really get exposed to lots of different things there. You're sort of overwhelmed by your senses almost as soon as you step into New York. But it's a melting pot where it's still just getting a little bit warm. Mm-hmm. And so you still actually have all these very distinct strains of different cultures and places that are here in New York, which I think is amazing for this topic of looking outside today, because you mentioned going over to um, Greenpoint in the Polish area mm-hmm. over, the, over the break, and it feels distinctly Polish. It hasn't fully melted in yet. Mm-hmm. So I, it's one of the things I love about it. And I think it's it's an interesting analogy with this place. So whether it's New York or whether it's those other parts of the world, uh, what is a place that has really sort of pressure tested you and, and sort of challenged who you are? Um, in my adult life, probably the one that's been toughest was Korea. It was when I was in business school, actually, I went over to Seoul. And that was, that was a tough one because I, I really moved myself out of a a comfort zone to a place where I didn't speak the language, tried to pick up a little bit of it while I was there, um, into a working culture that was also vastly different. So it wasn't just exploring the fun sites, going to great restaurants, and but it was actually trying to work in an environment like that. And I thought that was that was probably a tough one, but amazing from a, a learning and, and growth perspective, I'd say. I can imagine that when you're there and when you were growing up, sort of not only exposing yourself to those places, but also having to switch 
your approach whenever you moved into a different culture. Is that a part of why you are a naturally curious person and why you lean into sort of exposing yourself to things that maybe are a little bit unknown or ambiguous or uncomfortable even? I think that's part of it, but I think we're shaped by tons of experiences beyond that. And I suppose it may be less scared to try new things and to go to different places in a vast extreme from having moved around a lot as a younger child. Like I said, I went back to Ireland, went to um, secondary school when I was a teenager. And that was in a tiny, it was monastery actually run by monks. It was 200 boys boarding school. Uh, So very small, you would imagine parochial place, but it was a, a place where all the monks had lives before they joined the monastery and they were and they had interesting stories and they pushed us to not just learn what we needed to learn to pass exams but learn life lessons explore different philosophies explore different elements of history and i think that was where i really got into this idea of just trying um, not just trying new cultures, but actually learning new things, trying different disciplines, etc. And that led me then to college, where I actually studied European studies. So it was languages, politics, history. It was a a, a poly sort of a, a degree that, again, stretched me to look at different different disciplines. The degree that you took, it sounds like it was a natural follow on from the way that you grew up being exposed to lots of different things. And I stalked your LinkedIn before this, of course. So uh, I've got here your degree majors were Spanish history, politics, history of ideas. What is the history of ideas? Looking at what are big philosophical ideas or economic ideas that emerged over throughout history and how did they impact the world around them so it was looking at things like you would read rousseau and then you would look at okay what was the impact on what became the french revolution or you would read marx and you would say okay well how did this create the russian we're talking lots of revolutions here the russian revolution and so those were the types of things like what were how did ideas impact society it was fascinating loved loved that i wish i got to do more of that today it feels a little bit of like what you do with innovation and foresight and foresight in particular, because you're sort of with foresight, it's really stepping back and having a look at macro forces of change and how uh, not only how things are evolving physically in the real world, but also what are some of the big concepts that are potentially going to change how we operate in this decade. Like even like the, you know, the the metaverse exists today, but the metaverse is still very much this idea, this concept that we've many of us have fallen in love with. So do you, do you find that you get to carry that through into what you do within Foresight? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, that's partly why I've, I've loved doing Foresight over the last few years. That learning has almost come full circle, where you get to think about ideas like the metaverse today, compare them to what has maybe happened in the past and say, okay, so what could happen next? I'm a big fan of going deep into history or going broad across history as well as a way to think about the future because the this idea that things don't you know they don't necessarily repeat themselves but they rhyme i think there's there's something in that and you can draw from all these different angles and say what might happen and and things like the metaverse how do you tie that back to other things that have um, emerged in the past and what could happen mm. right i think i think i saw did you post something the other day on the on the internet will fade out by 1999 or one of those <laughs> the, one of those quotes i think i yeah. saw you posted that right I uh, did. <laughs> and and it's true right you see the same thing people writing the demise of of the metaverse already yeah well i think it's just really fascinating how you as an individual generally are fearful of change or maybe not skeptical but you're um you've got a certain sense of trepidation when it comes to really significant change in your life and so you assume that others feel the same way and then you project that whether it's in your personal life or in your work right you project that out so everybody is going to struggle with this and one of my favorite quotes looking back at those internet quotes from the 90s was well there's no way you're going to retrain millions of people to use this new technology it's like well it happened and and hindsight is a beautiful thing so how do you look back at not only history but hindsight and what silly predictions that we made Yeah, I love I love doing that, the same thing as you. What I also love doing is going back and, because there's a lot of things that have happened throughout history that have emerged, ideas that have emerged, that 
right now, we never think we're an issue. And you don't learn about that, right? Like you learn printing press was great, it revolutionized Europe. You don't you don't really read as much about all of the, I go back to monks again, monks and priests who said, hang on a second, writing is our domain. We don't want people to be able to read. That's not good. We need to control messages. And so there's lots of parallels to today when you look at things like blockchain and crypto and, and control over what we had before and not being open to what comes next. We're always fearful of what comes next, even as we we get used to what we're currently we're currently using. It seems like change is happening very slowly, but then it, it goes suddenly oh so quickly. It's what eleven years now, 2022, um, since Instagram launched in what 2011. That's a decade ago, right? And it it changed a lot. And we always talk the iPhone, but Instagram was huge in terms of suddenly imagery, not just text. It's just it's amazing how quickly these things do gain adoption. I think it's really interesting what you said before as well about like who is in control and thinking about that in the context of history and perhaps some of the lessons that we're learning today based on how the history was written or who wrote it. Are there any really interesting examples where you've you've sort of looked at, at historical events or even ideas of how it impacted the winners versus the losers? Oh, there's so many. I guess it's actually fun. There's a podcast I recently discovered, friends of mine, um, friends of mine told me about called Thinking About History. I think that's the name oh, yeah. of it. Um, from Tom Holland, who's this uh, great historian. His first book was a book called Rubicon, which was about uh, the end of the Roman Republic. And he's written something on the Persians. He's got written about the Augustan era. But he has this this history podcast and where they talk about moments in history and their impact on today. And it's just queued up, but they're talking about it. it's the 100 year anniversary of, of 1922, which was end of World War I. One, and you had all of this sudden these changes that happened in the world and not just history was written by the victors there but actually the makeup and the trajectory of the world was set by the victors of of world war one and what happened after that you had um now i need to listen to the podcast but my my hazy <laughs> recollection of it you have you know woodrow wilson who was the u.s president following world war one and he set the idea for the league of nations but then couldn't get america to join it so so this allowed one less power there, which is less of a checks and balances for the rise of, of the of the right in Europe in those intervening war years. You had um, the partitioning of Ireland and the beginning of the Civil War. So I'm Irish, obviously, think about that. But lots of other things that happened in, in that era. Um, and then you just look even beyond that a few year a few years later and you have the partitioning of of um of palestine and, and india as well and all this like their, their geographic makeup was set by the victors not just written by the victors and it's changed our whole human trajectory i would say I'm also incredibly fascinated in particular by world war 2 and in part because like you said like my family was there they lived through it I had um my great grandparents were hiding Jews and they got shot for it not to get too too serious on the podcast but you know I had like an emotional connection to it and so I love just you know learning more about it and really almost like um feeling the empathy of those who lived through it and it's it's one of those things that I hope that we never forget that we never sort of brush aside as being well that's not going to happen today because we know history like you said history history rhymes and so much of our world is shaped by big wars and whether it's cultural wars or whether it's land wars or trade wars or whatever it might be and so much of our even um you know the the resourcing the innovation that comes out of wars is just tremendous you know are we getting to a state where we're almost like growing out of them and becoming much more learned about the negative effects of them or are we are we coming into another one that we're not foreseeing oh it's such an interesting question and i don't know the answer but it's what i've thought a lot about actually um it's also funny you say like so much of human history has been shaped by wars it's that's also the way we get taught history in school Mm. but we don't get taught as much about what else happened in life in culture but back to your question in terms (laughs) of wars it's funny because in the wet in a lot of the western world yeah we haven't had many wars but the u.s has been in wars for 
a pretty long time. Yeah. It's just that uh, a lot of people are, they're, they're happening in other parts of the world. So we have less of this sort of land grab for resources, but there's almost the nature of war has changed. And we keep thinking, I suspect there will be, there will be more wars, but they're going to be fought so differently. Right, so it's going to be less about tanks on the ground, and tanks themselves were a huge change from horses, right? But you're going to have things like um, hacking into our infrastructure and shutting things down that way. Um, think about if all the lights suddenly went out. Uh, that's the sort of thing that I think could impact um, people on the ground in in wars of the future. We're definitely in a world where I can see one of the established liberal democracies crashing over the next decade i don't know which one and maybe there'll be more than one but i i I wouldn't be surprised if it happened and who knows what will come out of that will there be another war right so um was it's it's very bleak to think of things that way (laughs) but um but we should probably we should probably prepare for it (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Or even, you know, what you're doing, which is thinking about what are the potential consequences that we're not foreseeing and things like that, that feel, you know, very related to, again, what foresight does and, you know, um, how you can start to bring that really maybe very macro, very big picture thinking into what you do day to day. So that's what I wanted to ask you about is, you know, when you're When your mind is sort of going off into these areas of researching about different ideas that have shaped history, how do you then bring that back and connect it into what you do at work? Or do you? I definitely do. But it's more than history, I would say, when it comes to work. I I like to look pretty broadly at different I suppose everything becomes history right it's all if it's in the past is it <laughs> history I guess and I just enjoy the nature of learning new things and having new stories to tell I like to mix it up between looking at um, which economic ideas have have emerged I read a lot of newsletter digests um, there's one great one called next draft by a guy called Dave Pell he basically calls himself the editor of the internet and he pulls in all of these different stories every day and summarizes some of them and has some um, some great sort of sardonic commentary that goes along with them. And he's, he's very funny. And I read that because it gives you all sorts of links into different things. So he might go from an article on impeachment to what's, you know, how are they breeding goats in some other part of the world? So he'll have all <laughs> sorts of random things that he'll have in there. So I love that. I love looking at things like um, wait, but why? Um, looking at trivia. Uh, I love tri- like trivia digest emails, or there's one called Now I Know, which every day he sends out basically a story about something you might not have heard of that gives you another element or something you can draw on so it's looking at all of those different things that i think then helps with with our work listening to music it's watching film it's reading fiction and non-fiction all of those things together i think can play a part in helping shape ideas at at work for innovation or futures or what have you it's obviously a really interesting thing to do. It definitely sounds like a lot of fun to just go and explore these different areas and sort of just stretch your mind and stretch your thinking. How much analysis do you bring into that? Like how much of it is just exploration for the the joy of it versus sort of really getting critical and thinking critically about what you're reading? And most of it is exploration. And I don't think I ever consciously set out to do this, but at some point I noticed over the last I'd say eight to 10 years, probably. Whenever I would read or listen to something, you start to think, well, what can I do with this? It's kind of like the way you'll hear a joke and you'll repeat the joke in your head so that you can tell somebody else about it. I started almost doing that with whatever I was reading or listening to, where I would say, okay, so how is this useful? And then as you read more, you start to put this analysis together. So you're almost exploring, developing hypotheses, exploring a little bit more, proving or disproving your hypotheses, exploring a little bit more, building on your evidence. It's this constant cycle of exploration and analysis. And what I would do is if it's relevant to work or to a challenge or a problem that I I actually am supposed to be solving, I then like to think about it, get the story straight in my head or try it out verbally, talking about it to other people and then put pen to paper or fingers to keys. I can imagine also that when you're uh, when you're working with a, a client or a partner on a project through Ipsos that you 
or, you know, this is a bit of a generalization about clients being on the client side. Maybe I can say this, but often we come in with almost like an assumption or a pre-made opinion about something. So does that kind of thinking and perspective then help you to kind of go, okay, I can understand why they've come to that conclusion or why they want to prove this certain thing out. But I actually have seen almost like another side of it. Yeah, definitely. I also like to be fairly logical. And so I think that when a client will come with, or even somebody internally, anyone, right, will come with, here's a question. That question is often phrased in a very binary way or with an answer in mind. Like I just remember as early on in the pandemic, we would get like, oh, will people still go to the movie theaters when the pandemic is over or won't they? And they're looking for a yes, no answer. And Mm -hmm. there's, uh, you know, there, there isn't necessarily one. And so what I'd like to do is first say, okay, what's the real question that's behind that? Now, do we need to go further back in hypotheses and say, what is the real question? Or are we trying to prove or disprove the hypothesis that people have come to us with? There's a a great author called Warren Berger who teaches this or wrote a book on a more beautiful question who, and I I always find myself going back to that. Is this a why question? Is this a what if type question? Or is this a how question? Which are the three types that, that he talks about? And so I like to start with that. I think a part of it also is just like being able to ask questions. So not being afraid to venture into topics that potentially are a little bit sticky or, you know, um, come with a certain association or connotation to it and just being open to dig deeper. Yeah, yeah that's that's the hard part of as well, of course, right? Because mm-hmm. I think to really break questions down and be open to exploring things in an unbiased way, there's it's possible to offend people in doing that. And I think if you can make conversations a, a safe place for us all to explore and come up with our, our answers, I think that's that's what we need to do. And that's part of the problem, right? Well, I, I think it's impossible not to offend someone these days. And I, I, I don't know, I think a part of why I wanted to start this podcast was so that uh, we're building curiosity muscles and where yeah. we're sort of... Um, you know, like you talked before about history and sometimes, or a question even, and sometimes it's very black and white. So just, you know, really proactively looking for the gray and what is it that we haven't looked at deep, deeply enough? What is it that we need to venture off into that's maybe ambiguous or a little bit uncomfortable um, that will benefit you not only as a person, but also as, you know, a business leader. Yeah. So um, with that in mind and that sort of gray area, what's one thing that you've learned or explored about, um, it could be history or it could be anything else uh, that you think is really under leveraged in business strategy. I think either we we tend to, for business strategy, look at very recent business cases. People want to say, like, what, what has happened lately? And actually, I think the better stories and examples are often things that go a little further back. Mm-hmm. So looking a little less recent, I think, is, is an interesting way to look at things. And then... I also do think there's something really interesting about that idea of finding out what were the things that people thought would prevent an idea from spreading? How did they get past it? Again, when the pandemic started, everybody wanted to go back. They'd say, let's go back in history and look at what... Spanish flu and... Eventually, people got to Spanish flu. But they started with they started with Great Recession. And, and talking to your, your colleague at Mars, Jess, mm-hmm. she was like, let's go further back. Let's look at... Um, let's look at post 9-11 and what happened then. Let's look at the Great Depression. Let's look at Spanish flu. Let's go further back. What's happened during World War II? Let's look at the industrialization of America, like all these different, like huge seminal events and what what happened there. I think we're getting more openness to it, but that's one of the things that I think we we can all do a better job of is is looking deeper into history. I think we should keep doing that as well, just knowing that the pandemic is going on for two years now and we still don't have the answers to it. I think we're all just hoping it becomes an endemic and we we can move on, but I think it's safe to say that whatever le- lessons we learned and whatever we dug deep into in 2020, we still have a long way to go. So keep asking questions. Agreed. Yeah. Well, think on that, like back to your thing on Spanish flu. Like I never learned about Spanish flu. Like you'd learn about the end of World War One, but it was only until this that I realized, actually, that was actually a pretty big deal a hundred years ago. And 
it wasn't really talked about before that and i it makes me think sometimes like in a hundred years time will people talk about the this pandemic or will they will there be something else that will overshadow it and hopefully not a giant war yeah hopefully not but i I was listening to a podcast the other day which was um talking about the way that we work and there's some really interesting articles out there about the evolution of the workplace and um corporate life in general but specifically like offices and how we've we were sort of like led by you know factory workers led by the daylight hours to sit in these you know physical sterile places and how out of date and antiquated that seems now and I wonder whether that's something that we'll be looking back at post-pandemic going wow like thank god the pandemic at least gave us an awareness of of how we work and and how that's not really tailor-made to how we should be working. Absolutely. I think that's hopefully something great. And as long as we don't replace it with something worse, which is the only the only other fear. And I love what you said before is like how do we teach this sense of curiosity to people? And I think it's we need to teach that sense but also we need to teach critical thinking. So it's easy to go on that Wikipedia rabbit hole. The trick is forcing ourselves to then look at look at something from a different angle um, and a counterpoint and then make our own decisions as to what can work. Because sometimes we we immediately might go to, let's not go to the office again. And then some that causes some other problem. So how can we think more critically about it? I couldn't agree more. And also I think, because our brain is wired to like predictability, it likes to know if I look into this topic, these are the sorts of frameworks that I'm going to come back with. And when we're disrupted with something that's really unfamiliar and scary, we often reject it. Yes. Um, so how do we do less of that rejection and almost go into things a little bit more with that openness that you're going to encounter things that are a different viewpoint to yours or are going to be really foreign and really strange. And like, even I'm sure, you know, your time in um, like what you were saying, the Middle East and and Cyprus as well, I'm sure um, would have exposed you to lots of things where you, you had to kind of go, Oh, I can't reject this. This is my life now. Yeah, absolutely. It's almost a little bit like the old innovation idea of what are the sacred cows? And I was talking to a friend of mine recently who's a professor at NYU and he talked about, a whole different way that math is done or about a completely different way to to view time and maybe that's something we need to do like we're trying to fit things not going to the office around a 24-hour workday but maybe there's a different way to not a 24-hour workday a 24-hour day Phew. Uh, <laughs> but to look at things almost totally differently how can we look at like time as asynchronous um in this in this new world. So how can we be open to that? The problem is I'm, I'm, I'm great at thinking about it and exploring it, but if I had answers to any of it, then <laughs> I'd have tried yeah. to implement them by now. <laughs> yeah, I, I know what you mean, but I think that just, you know, your curious mind and being open to exploring or even asking questions of why are things the way that they are and not, you know, thinking about things as iterative changes, but what transformative changes need to take place. When we've worked together, it's been, you know, such a huge benefit coming into a project with that kind of, you know, um, curiosity and openness. So um, I've got one last question for you in that train of thought. What is your go-to when you're trying to push yourself to look outside? I don't have a go-to source. What I have is more of a go-to activity, which is stop thinking about what I'm trying to think about and actually go outside. I find the power of a walk or doing something that is completely the opposite of what I'm meant to be doing, like reading a book or listening to music or going for a run. It's when I do that and get away from trying to solve something that the um, the ideas or something comes to me. And maybe it's about just relaxing my mind um, allows that to happen. It's almost putting my mind in a different state. Yeah, well, it sounds like your mind is constantly going. So I can imagine that when you give it a bit of rest time. Yeah. It's, like... it's exhausting, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you do? What's your go-to? I'm curious. I think that uh, it's a combination of things on the books front. The sci-fi is like my favorite genre or speculative fiction, Mm -hmm. just to get my mind into the what if space, not the what is space. 
and uh, podcasts. I, I just love hearing about wars or even like uh, self-improvement podcasts, how to be a better human being, that kind of thing. And then speaking to people. I, I, I just love hearing different per, like people's perspectives and where, you know, what their experience is, like your history, how you grew up. It's just so fascinating. And I think it just takes you outside of thinking that everybody is like me. That's why coming to America has been such a great experience for me as well. We met when you were still in in Melbourne and then to come over here and see you doing this, it's pretty cool. I'm glad you're doing the podcast and looking at all these things. We need more people doing this type of stuff. So thank you. There is so much to take away from Philip's approach in staying curious, thinking critically and broadening your knowledge base and so much to read. All of his suggestions are going to be in the show notes. If you took any cool nuggets away from this podcast, and I really hope that you have, please do rate, review, and share it. I'll see you next time. So keep looking outside. Bye.